one of the more significant things that's going to happen is right before Pearl Harbor, FDR, another of his preparations, is to meet at the Atlantic Charter. And what this was was an, a meeting that created a document that formalized an agreement of alliance between the USA and Britain. Um, like I said, held in August 1941. And this is the first time that FDR and Churchill sat down. And what they did in this meeting, I only agreed that they would work together, um, but they also decided that they really did need to create this United Nations. Uh, after the war was done, they wanted to have a group where different countries could come and express their grievances, uh, similar to Woodrow Wilson's proposed League of Nations, because they really thought that maybe if Hitler had had some form of diplomatic means to say, here are my legitimate concerns, maybe war could have been averted. It was slightly optimistic, but this really is eventually going to give rise to the United Nations. Um, in terms of us as soldiers, after declaring war on Japan, uh, like I said, we do go ahead and join with the Allies, Britain, Russia, the Free French, um, and we send troops to England to help out with Stalin's idea of this two-front war. And then we do come to Northern Africa after El Al Alamein as well. Uh, we realized very quickly that the Luftwaffe had been the tool Hitler was most successful with, so we are going to create a pretty strong air force of our own. Um, it's called the USAAF, the United States Army Air Force, and we are going to kind of pull a Germany on themselves. Um, we are going to begin these risky bombings of German cities. Uh, we're going to carpet bomb most of the uh, German cities, Dresden being the most severely hit. Um, we are going to bomb during the day, and this is risky because it's easy to target us, and then the British are going to bomb the same cities at night. So it's a 24-7 bombardment of German cities versus the just night bombings that the Germans had been using um, in Britain. And eventually, um, our Air Force, we're going to make these really big planes. They're B-17s if you're into weaponry. Um, and they are so huge that when you looked up in the sky, it looked like this fort was coming at you. So it became known as the uh, Flying Fortress. Um, we did this um, in order to try to break the German will to fight, uh, just as they had tried to do. We are going to engage in bombings of civilian targets as well, not just military targets. Figured that the Germans had done it, so it was only fair. Um, and this is going to last for about three years. Uh, it was fairly dangerous for the, the soldiers to be involved in these types of missions, so after 25 missions, Flying Fortress crewmen were discharged. And here you can see the size of the planes. I mean, these are people, so these are huge planes. And that's quite an evolution in the use of our Air Force from the dogfights, the wooden buy and try planes of World War I. Planes alone, however, were not the only tool. We realized that we needed to use air, water, and land if we wanted to be successful. And we realized that in order to do a land attack, we needed to not only come up through Italy, but we needed to actually try to gain a foothold within um, mainland Europe, the northern part as well. And so we come up with this ultimate plan. The ultimate plan to crush the Germans once and for all was a plan that we later would call D-Day. And this happens on June 6, 1944. That's the first day of D-Day. Um, D-Day was a massive land attack. And the idea was that we were going to liberate France to put us right next to the Germans, and then we were going to be able to march right into Germany. The real name for Operation uh, for D-Day is Operation Overlord, um, but most people have called it D-Day as in Doomsday or Death Day um, after the fact. This is the largest amphibious assault in world history. Amphibian, think of a frog. It lives in land, goes on water. So this was the largest of those attacks. Um, the idea was go from England across the English Channel uh, to five different beaches in the French coastal city of Normandy invade the beaches, storm them, like send thousands and thousands of troops, right, run out of the boats, up the beach, go and, like, literally just run and find Germans and kill them. And there are five beaches that we codenamed Gold Juno Sword, Omaha, and Utah that were to be used for the D-Day attack. 
Um, we were responsible, the U.S. was responsible for Utah and Omaha, and we experienced a 90% casualty rate per unit. So that meant 90% of the U.S. troops involved on that day were killed or wounded. So that is a very high casualty rate. The British and Canadians and Australians who hopped out of Gold Sword and Juno are going to experience very similar um, casualty rates as well. Um, basically what happened was the day before, we sent a couple of Air Force divisions to fly over the beaches and see if we could see any Germans. Germans had actually been lying pretty low in the region. Um, some historians say they were actually planning to retreat the region. When they saw our Air Force, they figured that an attack was coming and sent reinforcements. Um, so they actually held an uphill advantage that we were not aware of because we didn't see them there. The overall commander of D-Day was Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was our general, our main general in Europe. Um, gets to start in World War I as well. His nickname was Ike. Um, after the war, he is going to be a hugely influential, uh, obviously, American. Um, he becomes the first commander of what's called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which we'll talk about in a bit. He was also the president right before JFK, the 34th president, and he also began the interstate highway system that creates, you know, flat, interconnected interstate roads um, like I-75 and those types of things. So if you're ever driving, you might see off to the side, you know, a sign that says interstate highway system from Eisenhower or something. So that's kind of cool. I digress. He is the one who comes up with the idea for D-Day. He is in charge of it. Um, 150,000 troops were dropped off uh, within the first 24 hours. Like I said, the Germans, they didn't know exactly what to expect. So they were taken pretty much by surprise other than the fact that they had known something was coming at some point. So they were kind of just sitting there um, at the top of the beaches. There's like a little foresty region. Uh, and then when this herd of troops come over, the Germans send reinforcements, and because they have the uphill advantage, a stalemate is going to set in. Um, and so we're going to start experiencing supply troubles because we didn't expect there to be Germans there at all. So it does become a huge, very deadly battle, as depicted in Saving Private Ryan. At least that part of the, of the movie is pretty accurate. And here you can see the, where the beaches are. Uh, and this is like an image. This is what I'm talking about. You'd run out of the boat, th wade through the water, up the sand with all your gear, and then it's uphill, so you're trying to run uphill and shoot and fire while the Germans are masked in, in like these trees, and they're shooting down at you. So because we start experiencing supply problems, we come up with this idea to send reinforcements uh, of supplies. And this is called Operation Market Garden. I always just think of it as you get supplies from a market or a garden. Um, and this was planned by General Montgomery, the same guy who fought in El Alamein, the British commander. And his plan was let's liberate the Netherlands and sneak in through the Netherlands behind the German line and kind of sandwich them between our men on the beach and these new troops that we'll have, um, we wanted to do an airborne attack where we j flew over the Netherlands, soldiers jumped out, exactly how the Netherlands had been captured. Um, the problem was, was that there were two German SS Panzer divisions in the area, their tank divisions, so they were able to plow us down, um, and this, we do land, and we do eventually liberate the Netherlands and all this stuff, but it is such a slow process that it does not work in terms of getting the supplies to the Allies. So here's Market Garden. So because this was a setback, because now the idea for a supply line to the troops on the beaches is cut off, we become desperate. And so what happens is we just wind up after a few days pushing up those beaches with everything we possibly could. It was almost like a kamikaze mission for ourselves. The Germans, they too had become uh, beleaguered by fighting for days, and so they weren't expecting this huge assault, and we caught them again by surprise and were able to defeat them. Uh, this is going to force what Germans are not killed to start retreating um, through France, allowing us to liberate France. And therefore, by December of 1944, we're on the offensive on all fronts of the war. So this is a major turning point, again, why I call it um, a watershed. You'll notice I don't call Pearl Harbor a watershed. It really wasn't much of a battle. We, we tend to call it that, but the U.S. did not have a lot of time to fight back. 
was it significant in watershed date? Yes. But certainly compared to D-Day, not the huge battle that we normally think. This is a full-on battle. The last full-on battle for the Germans um, was the Battle of the Bulge. You know, a couple months after D-Day, the Germans are now trying to fight this war on so many fronts, and they're running out of supplies, and their morale is running low. They make one last-ditch effort called the Battle of the Bulge. This is the last German offensive of the war. Uh, they were trying to sneak through this forest, um, the Ardennes, which are on the border of France and Belgium, to reach the Antwerp, uh, which is a city in Belgium in an um, effort to try to snake their way back behind the Allied line. The Germans failed miserably, largely because General Patton was in the area, and Patton, who is another commander from World War I, um, he is going to fight for the U.S. so exceptionally hard that he defeats any last hope for the Germans ever recovering. Um, we had sent an airborne division, but it was December, so it became very, very snowy, so our Air Force wasn't able to be very effective. Um, so as a result, we rely heavily on our tanks, and the ta our tanks versus the German tanks in this land battle in this forest. Um, it wound up destroying so many of the Germans' tanks, as well as, again, a lot of lives, that the Germans used most of their supply up, while they were still fighting the Soviets on the Eastern Front, this shortens the war. They just ran out of supplies, ran out of men, and went, ran out of the will to fight. So Battle of the Bulge, last German offensive, huge failure for the Germans. Largely due to our commander, General Patton, um, who I just said got his start in World War I as well. He was nicknamed Old Blood and Guts. He was hard as, as bricks, you know, very bullish with his troops of his soldiers. He would send his, his um, troops in, you know, and he didn't mind risking a couple lives. At one point, uh, when they were running low on supplies, he's like, well, my men can eat their belts when we need gasoline to fight. Um, he was asked to surrender a couple of times. His response was nuts. He was not going down. Um, he was just a very, very determined man. By many stances, he was very strict, somewhat harsh, but his troops loved him. Um, he died in a car accident just six months after the war ended, and he is buried in Luxembourg. Uh, my uncle's dad, um, uncle by marriage, was one of Patton's drivers during the war, not obviously during the car accident. And to this day, he just reveres Patton. He's like, yeah, the guy was tough and the guy was mean. If you've ever seen the movie Patton, it shows this. But he did it because he cared about his men and he cared about his country. And so for that, he was very well respected. And here are some very pixelized versions of pictures of Patton. You can just see, just, you know, very hard-nosed. So after his victory at the Battle of the Bulge, the war is starting to end. Um, we had managed to position ourselves, the Allies, in such a way that following the Battle of the Bulge, gradually the U.S. troops, the U.S.-British troops, managed to link up with the Soviet troops. So this zip pinch move that I keep talking about, this is where the fingers have finally come together. It cuts the German army in two, um, right in their capital, right in Berlin. Um, they were surrounded, they were out of options, and so they ultimately surrender. Um, the U.S. troops in this battle, the Battle of Berlin, were led by a guy by the name of Omar Bradley. Um, the Battle of Berlin was huge battle, very costly in life, mostly for the Soviets. We had them, again, do most of the work. Um, and ultimately, like I said, the Germans are going to surrender on April 30th, 1945, that evening. Um, you know, the paperwork isn't actually signed to the next day, but this marks the end of the war in Europe. Um, the Soviets captured the city in, in the process. They, um, they lost 100,000 lives because Hitler had ordered everybody in the city to fight to the death. He himself, this evening when he realized that they were about to lose, wound up committing suicide um, in a bunker with his mistress, Ava Braun. Um, the exact details are sketchy at best. We know cyanide was involved. We also think there was a fire. The Soviets claim at one point that they found his body. Um, however, there's a lot of controversy, a lot of conspiracy. So what exactly happens, we don't know, other than we know that he commits suicide that night, allowing the war to ultimately end.